Right. Thank you very much for the introduction. Thank you very much for inviting me here and to give me an opportunity at that place to talk about, in this, t this time, business cases for structural health monitoring in aviation. I think structural health monitoring, or SHM, like we say, has a very long tradition here. 1999, so the last millennium, we were already here running a workshop on that subject. And it's really very much, well, I'm very much pleased to see how things are progressing here. Just the presentation before here from Dr. Sundaramana was uh, some like a proof what has happened here. And uh, he's mentioned the question, enhance the speed in NDE. Uh, that is one thing. The other thing is also to design structures in a way that they can be tested. Now, one of the answers regarding that one could be SHM. And just for you who are not fully familiar what SHM is about, um, that is what I call SHM in one single slide. What you see here is an aircraft, an aircraft being in operation, and uh, we have to record the loads. We had uh, the presentation this morning from Ido Kressel showing how you could monitor the loads. Then we need to do some prognostics, um, and uh, for those ones, we need the loads. We need the load sequence. And then there's a stochastic process happening, which means the structure is going to damage, but that is not really at a specific definite uh, instant. There is a scatter in that one, and this is what you see here on the upper right-hand figure. So we use the prognostics to hopefully see when a crack is happening and when a crack of a defined size is happening. And uh, to do that one, I'm not monitoring continuously, well, not monitoring at, at, at defined stages. We introduce sensing in a sort of new technological way, like it was mentioned uh, before by, by Ian Jennings, and uh, continuously maybe monitor that structure. And that we feed back to the structure, and the structure is basically then saying when an inspection is due. So what you realize here, the key issue is damage tolerance, something which, we, which is at home in aviation. And when you look at damage tolerance, we have, and you just look here on the left-hand figure, we have the sort of allowable damage, which is the critical crack length, let's say that way from, from a metallic point of view, and then we have another limit, which is the limit of the detectable crack length, and this is where non-destructive techni uh, technologies come in. Now, that detectable crack length, of course, as we can all imagine, depends on the technology we have and on the capability we have to detect a crack or a damage reliably. And that is described very briefly with some, something which we call the POD curve, so, so the probability of detection. And that, of course, depends on what technology we are applying here. So these are the sort of two main key uh, parameters we need. Now, if we're able to monitor a structure, then our design criteria might change. And as we've just seen before, it's that, it, it's that interval, delta n, which defines the inspection interval. And um, it is the one which we can influence if we introduce uh, sensors. So what you see here is one of the standard panels, just like the one we've shown before, with stringers, with frames. And um, if we do, uh, from a damage tolerance point of view, and damage tolerance, by the way, is even discussed today uh, from the point of view of composite structures, not even just metallic structures. So, and if you have a condition where you have to make an assumption you design, like you see here on the upper right-hand side, so you cannot inspect your stringer from the outside, then you have to make an assumption the stringer is broken, of course, that shortens your uh, crack propagation life. While if you just have the information about the integrity of the stringer, that will immediately change your crack propagation life significantly and, of course, also your inspection interval. So in, in just in sort of summary here, uh, what we have is we can either, with monitoring, gain life, or usually in, in aeronautics we don't want that one, so we can increase strength, which means we can design lighter weight. So that's the contribution. This is how damage tolerance comes in. Now, people have analyzed, and Hans-Jürgen Schmidt has been one of the key people, uh, formerly with Airbus, now retired, and he has analyzed what would happen if we would put string uh, uh, sensors 
around stringers and frames, and you just see a few figures here without going into the details, but we could have potentials of, wave, uh, of saving still another about 15 to 20% in structural weight if we would put sensors around there. Now, the variety, we have a variety of sensors. We got uh, this morning presented uh, fiber bag ratings. The piezoelectrics have been mentioned. There's, of course, also a variety of other parameters which we use. There is electromagnetics, uh, which could be one. Well, acoustics has been mentioned. There could be also a temperature. Uh, so we have a variety of parameters which we can use and of sensors which we can integrate into the structures. And this is just a, a slide choice of things being around here. Now, what is important in, inter in integrating sensors into a structure is not just to put the sensor in. If you say to operators today, I'm going to get additional sensors in, they will immediately reject your idea. The reason is just the reliability of the sensors. So what we really need is to integrate a system. SHM has to be a system, a system like the avionics system, a system like a, like a jet engine, and these are systems which have a reliability. And it has to be, to be designed the same way, which means the electronics, the redundancy, all those things have to be in the system so you are able to provide uh, the reliability of that system. Now, when it comes to the point that then to, monitoring a, uh, to monitor a real structure, and if you take, for example, an acoustics approach, so you send through an acoustic wave like we do that traditionally with non-destructive testing, then, of course, you have a problem about the acoustic wave having to travel through a coating, from one panel to the next one, through a rivet. So just that figure which you see here shows you a little the problem. You have to put your transducer somewhere outside, let's say, of your rivet line, and you have the crack starting somewhere inside, just next to your rivet, between the, ta uh, uh, the, uh, the panels somewhere, and that acoustic wave has to hit specifically that location, and you must get a signal back from there which tells you this is the crack size you have now at the moment. And if you do those things, of course, there's a variety of people testing those ones, including ourselves, and uh, we get, of course, results, but usually that's on, I would say, sort of uh, very generic uh, uh, panels with maybe a few rivets or a few holes. But really to understand when does it can be, it can be efficient, you need to do a few studies. And these are some studies we've done a few years back here. First of all, starting very generic and just seeing what is happening when an acoustic wave travels through a panel which has a hole or different holes like we have on the rivet line. And what you see there, of course, is a scattering of the signal. And that's what you just see on the lower hand uh, right, um, uh, right figure here, the simulation. So you see there, is, there are zones where you get a signal from that hole at the moment, and um, there's other ones where you don't get a signal. Now, of course, we don't want to see holes there. What we want to see is cracks starting from the holes. So you have to go a next step, and that's what's shown here. So you get a signal from a rivet line or holes, and uh, what is now happening if a crack is progressing here? And what you see here is, first of all, the reference on the left-hand side where there's no crack, taking that one and subtracting that one from the subsequent signals you get when you have a crack. And you see there's a 10 millimeter crack, there's a, a 50 millimeter crack, and I don't know, we don't have a pointer here, do we? No. Uh, but may, maybe I have a cursor here, no. Uh, but, but somehow you can recognize there's a s small tiny crack, and that crack gets bigger, up to 20 millimeters, and it's just around there when you see something in the proximity of those rivets, really, a different signal, uh, which allows you to tell we've got a crack now. So these are the size of cracks we have. Oh, thank you. Here it is. Sorry, sorry. Yes, yes, yes. So this is this is where, where you see a concentration here regarding the cracks. Uh, that's a 50 millimeter crack, a 20 millimeter crack. So you see, we need a crack length of about 2.5 times the river diameter to be monitored further away, no further away than 12.5 times the river diameter. So we need to monitor quite close to those rivets. Now, we at Fraunhofer, ISAFP, to not repeat again uh, the, the German wording in non-destructive testing here, have developed such systems, and here you see such sort of system with sensors and uh, um, an electronic part with it, which can be integrated in structures. You also see here an aeronautical structures where we've done tests of that nature. 
Those things, if you look at big structures, you need to have a network of those structures. That network needs to be combined. You need a, a wireless data communication for, for this one. And where we have successfully applied those things is, first of all, not in aeronautical structures, because a lot of things are very much standardized there. But we've gone into the wind energy business, because the wind energy business is sort of, they have a big need to monitor their damages. And also, they can allow for larger damages. So your system can work quite efficiently, relatively quick there. And what we've done with the systems is, we allow those systems to monitor uh, passively, based on acoustic emission, actively in terms of acoustic ultrasonic, so we send in an ultrasonic signal and record it in another place, and uh, we use uh, those piezoelectric patches like you see here on the top, and also piezoelectric actuators to send in the signal. And you see one of the test wind energy turbine blades uh, here on the right figure. Now, the important thing to get those sensor systems in is to have the understanding of that structure, and this is something which can be done in design. You just see here a sort of simulation where you can see on the simulation where to put your sensors to reliably see critical damage, and these are the positions of a variety of those sensor systems on such a wind energy turbine blade. Now, those things are simulated to just to find out what sort of damage you can see. And then, of course, you also record the data continuously. And uh, basically, you, do, you look, in our case, at the correlation coefficient along the different signal paths. And whenever you see there is a deviation, you get a signal of a decent good damage, which allows you to, or which tells you to shut down now uh, the, uh, the wind energy turbine system and uh, repair will be required there. Now, if we have a variety of different sensors, it's the question, how do we get the best out of the signal? And uh, one of the techniques where we've, well, which we, where we've worked on and um, uh, which is also, I'd say, sort of um, reward in terms of uh, compu computation technology is what we call sampling phased array. Now, you might have heard of a phased array, and the phased array is basically is a variety of different transducers which work a little like a radar beam. Now, if this is your phased array up here with, let's say, four different transducers, one of the transducers is sending a signal, and all the other ones are recording. And we're doing all the combinations, so you see the second one is sending now here, and all the other ones are recording. The third one is sending and all is recording, and the fourth one is, uh, is sending and all the other ones are recording. So we get a huge matrix of time domain signals, single time domain signals from one transducer to the other one, which we all store in the database. Now having all those data in the database, what we can do now, we can basically phase shift those signals and run those ones through an optimization process. Basically, we get those results, what would be, have been the optimum signal to see damages in such a structure. And without going into details, but that shows you a little the difference between conventional phased array. So sending an acoustic beam like a radar beam into a structure, and you see that sort of testing sample here with a variety of different little holes, and that's the back wall here. And you see, of course, you can very nicely recognize the holes here. But on the right-hand side, you see that sampling phased array technique. So basically just recording all the data in a shot and then doing the optimization in in a, in, in a computer. And what you see, the resolution has significantly enhanced. And whatever comparisons we're doing, it's every time the same thing. We came to the optimum with that technique. Now, that gives a lot of hope also to apply those things on disparate transducers in a structure, uh, looking at the structural health monitoring side. That's just another figure just to tell you that's not just limited to metals. You can also apply it to composites, and again, the same thing happens. You get an ex extremely good resolution, and you see really everything what you can um, and, and what you must see. And that's, by the way, also one of the contributions in, uh, towards enhancing the speed of uh, non-destructive testing also in, com uh, in composite structures. Now, since I want to talk about uh, business cases here, the question is, where is the benefit of structural health monitoring? And those of you who are involved in the maintenance business know there is an MSG group continuously talking about how to organize maintenance, and this is a little what's related to structures and maintenance. We have the principal structural elements and those ones damaged due to fatigue, 
due to environmental damage or due to accidental damage. And you see on that process chain here, all the things which are highlighted in red are areas where SHM has a relevance. I've mentioned regarding the inspections, the same applies to corrosion, and the same also specifically applies to repairs happening from accidents or maybe areas which are very prone to accidental damage. Now, the big question comes really where to invest in terms of preventing damages. Now, Ian Jennings has mentioned about the integrated vehicle health management. That's, this is just looking differently at that one. Now, if I have an aircraft and I'm operating that aircraft and I have all those different numbers, and I'm not, not going through the detail of those numbers now here, but what comes at the end is if I have such an expensive asset, the operational cost of the aircraft, that's the most valuable. So getting the aircraft to fly is important. I think just in this country, those days you realize, again, the problem with the 787. Suddenly the aircraft have to be phased out. That costs the airlines here a huge amount of money. Now, if you look regarding maintenance, we have the maintenance people. They also cost money. But if you go to Europe, a maintenance person might cost you something like 75 euro per hour. In India, it might be less. But what definitely that figure tells you, the aircraft availability is key, not even the equipment to sell them. For 75 euro per hour, you can have a lot of people maintaining the aircraft. So what we've done, we have looked at an aircraft type and possibly one of the most popular aircraft types uh, currently flying around and looking how can we optimize the maintenance process. So what we've done here, we've looked what are the sort of things you have to look at an aircraft. Of course, there are the checks, there's a variety of components, all those things are prescribed, these are the letter checks, and that's all described in a variety of different job cards and, 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 and whatever check modules they have. Then we also have the service bulletins, which came additionally to those ones, which may go into the letter checks or not. And then we also have the dropout items, which we just mentioned before with the human being. We need more and more of the senses when we age. That was a very, very remarkable uh, remark. And the same applies to structures also. So we looked at all those things and uh, looked regarding a sequence. So that's mainly looking at the various intervals, which are all organized there in the maintenance facilities. And we asked ourselves, if we get those maintenance processes organized, and this is only schematically showing a maintenance process, so this would be the maintenance interval. So we looked at the process of the process chain. We asked ourselves, where along that process chain do you have components which are related to a structure and where we could contribute in implementing a structural health monitoring system? So this is what's happening here in the different steps. You have here that, that sort of introducing SHM, and then we'll look what difference does that have on the maintenance process. Now, what we used was a commercial tool called Arena, where you can do that sort of plug and play. So we did that one, basically went through those processes, learned uh, from, from the operator and specifically the maintenance facility uh, how that was all organized. And the way that it was organized specifically for a D check, which is the major check, was that they have, first of all, three major groups, one related to the flight controls, the other one to the engine and the land landing gear, and the third one to the structure and the composites. And it was the structures and composites which were the ones which were specifically inter uh, interesting for us. So looking into those ones, and they had everything very nicely grouped, and these are sort of various groups which were there, and with our program, we could even put uncertainties on the different maintenance uh, uh, interval and, and, and maintenance processes. So we made 100 maintenance intervals for all those different maintenance processes. And what we found out was quite remarkable. A, a variety of those packages were always on the critical path at any sort of variation you had on the maintenance process. Only a few ones were less than 100% on the critical path. They only appeared a few times on the critical path. Now, the other thing was which of those packages had structures involved. And the ones which had structures involved were just two of those, one only appearing 15% of the cases on the critical path, the other one 100%. Now, after analyzing those ones, what turned out was that the savings were absolutely marginal. I'm not going to the text all up here, but these are sort of average numbers. So three hours in maintenance hours difference out of 400 hours. What we then did, we said, well, what would happen if we would introduce 
structural health monitoring sensors around the aircraft like, just like a human body. Even there, the savings would be marginal, just 26 hours. Of course, that is money, but compared to the variations we have, that's very small. And what that tells us is the structural design process and the maintenance process are incredibly well organized. So there is not much to gain there anymore. You really have to change the complete design if you want to do that, but that's not what we want to do here. Now, where are really the benefits? Now, the benefits come exactly regarding the remark when we get older. When an aircraft gets older, we also have things which we call, or they call dropouts. So you have structural components which need to be, uh, to be checked out of schedule, inspected out of schedule. I'm just giving you one example where we have the privilege to work on. Now, these are those gantries here, basically those um, load transmission um, Beams are relatively complex where cracks could occur and where you have inspections which are outside of the scheduled inspection. Now, we simulated that one, first of all, simulating the number of manpower, and even we increased the number of manpower, which you see in that curve here, it went down to a saturation, because physically that's not possible that you have 100 people just looking at one of those gantries. But even from a, from, from, from a process simulation point of view, you would not come below 120 hours to be maintained just for those gantries for the rest of the life of each aircraft. So we looked what would happen if we would introduce a sensing system, an SHM system, and this is the difference you see here. These are the 120 hours we had before uh, we would come down to 20 hours to save 100 hours per aircraft. So this is just one of the variety of examples uh, where SHM could generate uh, benefit. So if I want to conclude here and basically say what, the, what message do I want to bring you over here, so I'd say the first one, there is further damage tolerance potential in structures and there is hence business cases here where SHM can be beneficial. SHM needs to be considered as a system, so not just the single transducers, the single sensors, but also the electronics and the redundancy. Guided acoustic waves is a popular means for SHM, but it might lack quality with increasing structural complexity, and we've seen the complex structures which appear there. If we want to apply those techniques, we need to have relatively complex SHM systems, which can be developed, but which need very much to go in line, in line with design. The sampling phase array technique is a very interesting technique to enhance the, uh, uh, the quality of, uh, of the signal processing here with multi-transducer monitoring systems. Uh, structural design and maintenance are well optimized currently with our aircraft. That gives us good confidence, but there's also not the big potential with the new aircraft, but definitely with the old ones, and I haven't mentioned the military aircraft, which even go for a much higher age compared to the civil aircraft. So the true business case for SHM is if you don't change your design completely, which is a different story, much longer term, is definitely in the aging business, and I think we have enough aging structures here. Thank you very much, and I'm happy still to answer some questions if you wish. Uh, thank you very much, Professor. I think it's a fantastic lecture. <coughs> And with the, we also have realized the need for SHM on the ECART, uh, particularly on the military products. Our LCA Mark II, we are going to have as SHM. Already the uh, research work has started, and he is probably one of the consultant for Vijayaraju and along with the NAL team. But the biggest challenge is validate the model, what, validate the design which we are putting for SHM on the ECART, and say this is how it should be used, and declare that it is safe or it is unsafe. So that's a lot of effort is required. I think we will graduate, and eventually this is an essential requirement, we realize, and I think the cooperation with this institution and NAL and our ADA will eventually realize a system for our LC and other uh, emerging platforms like AMCA and DECOP.